you on? Are you out of batteries? Are you are you on on your hip? I, I didn't put the headphone thing on. No. It's, I left it in my office. I'll go no, get I'll it during it. the first count. That's what you're saying. Okay. All these things to remember. I'm sorry if you expected me to be perfect. <laughs> Welcome. I hope uh, you've been having a good holiday weekend. I expect that as the as the holiday has come now on Sunday, uh, you've already had some uh, you've already had some hot dogs and seen some fireworks and things like that uh, already. Um, are there any announcements that anyone would like to make? I know of one. There's one over here. We put a fellowship uh, sign up sheet on the back table. Yes. We're going to be doing that the last Sunday of every month, so the sign up sheet is there. If you would please take a turn. That would be great. Thank you. Yes. Just wanted to uh, remind the, the men of the church that we're having our uh, men's cookout at Roger Harbison's house <laughs> July 13th, I believe. It's the day before the fair starts. So. The day before the fair starts. Okay. I know I have when the fair starts on my, my calendar, but I don't think I have that on the calendar yet. <laughs> Sign up sheet for tech training on Thursday starting at 8 o'clock or 10 o'clock. This yeah, Thursday is. starting at 10 o'clock. Gosh, my Thursday is, is piling up with things. I don't think I'll be able to be there at 10 o'clock. Anyway. There'll be a second training for those that can't make it. Excellent. Excellent. Then there was an announcement about winners. Guess what they might have won. Yes, we have our winners for points for Kenya, our guessing game. And some of you people are really, really good at estimating. Okay. The actual amount of money was $48.94. <coughs> Roger Harbison was the closest of $48. And Gene Schaefer was really good at guessing weight. The actual weight was six pounds, two and one quarter ounces. And Gene guessed six pounds, four and a half ounces. That's close. So they each have a gift card to Casey's. Don't spend it all in one place, but I think you have to. <laughs> <laughs> Any other announcements? Well, I want to say again, welcome to all of you. It's good to see you here. Let us now turn to our call to worship. Join me in reading the call to worship. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The Lord, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders the Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a wild, a young wild ox. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Let us worship God. Our first hymn is Lift Every Voice and Sing.
have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse from us all unrighteousness. Please join me in reading the call to confession. Holy God, we are afflicted. Hard bondage is laid upon us, and it is we ourselves who have made it so. We strain under the burden of all iniquities. It is more than we can bear, and so we call out to you, Lord and our God. Hear our voices, O Lord, and see our affliction, our toil, our oppression. Bring us out of this Egypt of our own making. Holy God, have mercy on us. Blot out our transgressions according to your unfailing love. Make us new so that we may follow you and praise your holy name. We pray in the name of him who is our Savior. Amen. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. First reading comes from Jonah, from the third chapter, starting in the third chapter, verse 10, and going to the fourth chapter, verse 5. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, we are grateful for many blessings that you have showered upon us, and we come here to this place to sing your praise. But we also come humbled, knowing that we need to hear your voice. We need to hear your message so that we may follow in the path that you have set for us. Help us to discern that message. Open our ears to hear it and our hearts to receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please listen for the word of God. When God saw what he did, what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways. He had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, 
and waited to see what would happen to the city. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Jonah into the sea. And they were right. That's what did it. 
it says they, they took Jonah, then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. So it worked. It worked. So who do you think, of all the people on that boat, who do you think suggested that the solution to their problem was throwing Jonah into the sea? Jonah himself suggested it. That's right. I think if I were on that boat, I'd have said, nope, nope, that's, I don't think that's the reason. It's not the, the, that's not the solution to this problem. No, Jonah acknowledged that it was him. He had admitted to them that he was the reason that the sea was raging. But what had he done that would anger God, that God would do that? He had run away when God told him to go to Nineveh and tell them to so why did Jonah run away? He, he didn't want to go to Nineveh to tell them. Was it because he was afraid they might attack him? Like, they, like the people that uh, Jeremiah was sent to. They, they threw him into a cistern. And he, it was several days in the cistern before he was rescued. Nope, it wasn't that. Was it because, like Isaac, he thought he was unworthy? Was it like Jeremiah again, who said, Ah, oh Lord, truly I don't know how to speak, for I am only a boy. No, nope, it wasn't that either. Was it because he was afraid that he might fail to get them to repent? No, nope, that wasn't it either. It was not because he thought he might fail, but because he was afraid he might succeed, and he didn't want to. After recovering from his time in the whale, he went to Nineveh and proclaimed that Nineveh would be overturned. That's the NIV word. All the other translations I looked at said overthrown, which I think uh, speaks to us a little bit better. Overthrown because of its wickedness. First the people hearing the proclamation, and then a little bit later the king who heard about it indirectly. They repent. The king rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust, says NIV. Ashes, say most other translations. Sat down in the dust and ashes. When God sees that this happens, God repents. God changes his mind about destroying Nineveh. And he, 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 uh, he decides that they should be shown mercy instead. And when Jonah hears about this, does he celebrate the success? No, we heard our reading. He does not celebrate the success. He proclaims, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. That seems strange, doesn't it? When we think about wanting to go out and give the good news of God, and people will listen to it, and they will, they will uh, repent from sinful things that they have done. Of course, that supposes that we're thinking they're more sinful than we are. But we're all sinful in one way or another. Even those who try very hard, we're all sinful in one way or another. And you'd think he would be happy that he had succeeded. If he's a, a prophet for God, surely giving that message and having them turn to God should be a good thing. But it isn't what he wanted. He acknowledged that he was sinful. He acknowledged that when he prayed and when he gave praise to God after <coughs> his rescue from the, from the, the whale or the fish or whatever. He is grateful for that, but he is angry that that mercy should be given to Nineveh also. He thinks, even though he was sinful, 
in a way like them. He thinks he's more worthy of forgiveness, worthy of mercy than they are. In our gospel reading, the Pharisees and the teachers come while Jesus is having dinner with all those tax collectors. Tax collectors were not thought of very well by the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Tax, tax collectors were Roman citizens. They might have been Jewish people who had become Roman citizens. And what they do, I learned about this from a roommate I had when I was in graduate school who, who had earned a PhD in, uh, in classics. And as you might expect with someone uh, with a PhD in classics, he's now working as a programmer. <laughs> but he told me that the way the tax collecting worked is, is you would, someone, some enterprising person would say, go, would go to the Senate in Rome and say, give me a license to collect tax for you in this region. And so what they would do is they would go and they would collect, they, they had to pay money to the Senate, and then they would go and they would collect tax. Um, and if they collected only as much as they had paid to the Senate, they would have just wasted their time. So they do what they can to collect a little more. They, they're aggressive because anything more is theirs. So these are people who did things, did everything they could to collect as much tax from people that they could. So they were unpopular in lots of places, but they were unpopular especially in uh, Jerusalem and, and uh, the land that God gave to, uh, to the descendants of Israel. Because it represented that this land wasn't controlled by them anymore. And it was... Uh, also a government that insisted that their, the head of the government, Caesar, needed to be think, thought of as if he were a god, which was offensive to them. So the Pharisees and the, and the teachers of the law look on these uh, tax collectors as an element of evil in their land, who are uh, oppressing the people there and making them subject. Some, some other entity that is proclaimed to be as a god. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law do not think that these tax collectors are worthy of God's mercy. Just more or less in the same way that Jonah doesn't think that the tax collectors are worthy of God's mercy. Now like Jonah, um, like Jonah, they felt they were not, the others were not worthy of mercy. And I would ask, how much do we still do the same thing? Where we come here, we thank God for the mercy. We confess our sinful nature. We are assured that God, that in God we are new creations. And then we walk out from this place, these new creations of God, where the old has passed away, and we go out and we look at other people and we think, gosh, they're not worthy. We do that. I do that. I try not to. I'm ashamed when I find that I have done that. How many times do I not recognize that I have done that and just go on with my uh, prejudices and preconceptions of other people? Um, I don't think any of you are unworthy. <laughs> Rest assured that I don't think anyone is unworthy. At least that's what I say here. But when I go out and I actually look at people, how much do I hold on to uh, my first judgment of them? How much do I hold on to a belief that they are less worthy of God's mercy than I am? Other times, I will admit, I lie in bed and wonder how worthy of God's mercy I myself am. We go out and we look at people. You, you look at someone else and you can't re 
really know what it's like to be them. We see other people, especially people we don't know. We see someone walking down the, down the street, and they're really just a caricature to us. <coughs> they're not, that's not who they really are. But to us, we can't really know what they're like. We see them walking down, dressed in a certain way, but we can't, we, it's hard for us to understand uh, you know, them getting up and looking at the clothes they have to wear the day, that day and choosing those clothes and making and doing all the things that we ourselves do. It's hard to look at other people and fully understand the humanity, the, 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 the moral being that is there. And since we can't conceive of that, we know that that's true. We know that they do the same things that we do. They get up in the morning, they, they do all the things we do in the morning to get ready. But because we don't live that in their lives, it's hard for us to see them really on the same, uh, the same way we see ourselves. However, it's a great insight to know that we are actually far more alike than we are different from other people. But in that same way, we should be willing to wish for them as much mercy, as much grace, as much uh, love, love of God and love of other people, as much understanding as we ourselves crave. And we need to do that. We need to recognize that in our past, our own personal past, but also the past of the civilizations that we live in, uh, Europe's uh, uh, days of empire when they took over, they, they got together in Berlin and decided which European countries owned which part of Africa. <laughs> no Africans were represented there. And, we, and they did the same thing sort of with North America and South America. Which European countries owned which portion? Because we did not recognize that uh, they went into those areas and looked at the way they ate looked at the way they talked, looked at the way they dressed, and we couldn't recognize that that was a civilization also, because we define civilization in doing things the European way. We can look back at our own country and uh, the shameful period in which American slavery existed, which we can read about slavery in the Bible, but the slavery in the Bible was nothing compared to American slavery. The slavery in the Bible never denied the humanity of those who were enslaved the way American slavery did. We can look back at the legacy where even after the Emancipation Proclamation, it took more than three years for the news of the proclamation to reach the slaves in Texas. They were free for three years before they realized they were free. Legally, they were free. And yet, uh, and then still, the, the, the legacy of that that lives on even to today. We need to uh, recognize the ways that we have thought other people are less worthy of God's mercy, less worthy of just treatment than we are. We need to Acknowledge that, repent, and then go and do what God asks us to do. And when God is merciful to other people, we shouldn't be disappointed like Jonah was. We shouldn't say, oh gosh, just kill me now. After this, Jonah goes, at the end of our reading, it says he goes to the edge of town and he sits to see what's going to happen. And the sun shines very hot. On him, So God causes a tree to grow in, in the span of a day, to grow up, to give him shade during the day. God shows mercy on him. 
And then the next night, God causes a worm to infect that tree, and the tree goes away instantly. It dies and it rots in the, in the course of the night. And the next day, the light is, the sun is shining bright and hot on Jonah again. And Jonah says again, oh, just kill me. And God says, are you angry? And he says, of course I'm angry. I'm angry because you took that tree away from me. And God says, what did you ever do to earn that tree? Did you make that tree? No, I gave you that tree. I gave it to you in the course of a, of a night, and I took it away in the course of the night. You might have been happy that it was there, but you have no cause to be angry that it's not there, because it wasn't there in the first place. grateful for the things that God has done for us, for the mercy and the grace that we have gotten. But we also need to be um, generous and loving and see the world, do what we can to see the world in the way that God sees it, as the thing that God so loved. Our next hymn is This Is My Song, um, which you'll see the words up here.
Prayers for uh, my co-worker's father in Arizona who had a massive heart attack. It was shocking four times to bring him back. He was in a coma. He got down there and he said he's fighting the nurses so they know he's not brain dead and he's coming around. So. Okay. <coughs> what joy that he is doing as well as he has, but yeah. I'm concerned for continuing. Yes. Another joy, we had six dogs at the farm this weekend and they all got along. <laughs> dogs are usually pretty good at that. They enjoy company. But yeah, yes, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you get one individual. But even those individuals are worthy of uh, mercy and grace. Anyone else? Ah. The puppet team is having very productive practice. Excellent. Excellent. Friends, this is the joyous feast of the people of God. They will come from east and from west, from north and from south, to sit at table in the kingdom of our Lord. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the loaf and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them and their eyes were opened and they recognized. This is our Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord God, creator and ruler of the universe. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us but still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only son to be one of us, to redeem us and heal our brokenness. Therefore we praise, we praise you joining our voices with the choirs and angels, with prophets, apostles and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place, and who forever sing to the glory of your name, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty and blessed, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, opened blind eyes, broke bread with outcasts and sinners, and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he leads us to eternal life. We praise you that Christ now reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. Remember your gracious acts in Jesus Christ. Remembering them, we take from your creation this bread 
and this wine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup that we bless may become the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast. United in ministry in every place, as this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Lord God, we remember those whose need we recounted a moment ago. We are grateful also for those blessings that we heard. We are grateful for the success of our, uh, our Independence Day celebration here. We ask your blessing upon all who are traveling during this holiday to get to where they are going and to get home again when it is done. We want, ask your blessing on people who are struggling with health issues, especially the man in Arizona who we heard about having a heart attack, but others closer to home, others close to our heart who we know are struggling with issues of, of health. Visit your mercy upon them. Let them know that you are with them, that your plan for them is one of welfare and not of evil. Watch over this church as it strives to do your work in this community. Watch over all of our brothers and sisters, other congregations of our denomination, other congregations of our community, and all others, wherever they are that strive to, to, to proclaim your good news and to do your good work. We ask your blessing upon them. We bring all of these prayers to you in the name of your Son, who gave us this sacrament, and who taught us to pray these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, our Lord sat at table with his disciples and shared a meal. And at the end of the meal, he took the bread, and he gave thanks for it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given to you. In the same manner, he took the cup, and he gave thanks for it too. And he said, This cup is the cup of the covenant poured out in my blood for you. Drink of it, all of you. As often as we eat this bread, as often as we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. going to bring to you the cup and the, the bread and I know that many of you have said can we get away from those things where we and that's what we've done however we still need to be a little mindful of these things so allow them to uh, put the bread into your hands rather than you grabbing
when you receive it, if you want to hold on to the bread, then we'll all take it together. Let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and this cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus our Lord. Amen. God has richly blessed us in many ways, and it is appropriate that we should also return a portion of what he has blessed us with for the use of this congregation. And I believe the, the, the plates are in the back, so you can leave your contributions. 
thank you for your contribution. Thank you. 